This evening we're going to continue in Psalm 119, and I believe we have a, a fresh topic to look at this evening in verses 25 through 32. And of course, since we try to gear the whole service around the theme that is in the message, it shouldn't be a surprise that the theme here is revival, personal revival. Uh, again, the Lord would have us to pray for, um, well, the revival of His church, of His body as a whole. He would have us to pray for revival outside the church, that He would awaken and quicken people who are uh, outside, well, who are, who are basically dead in their sins. But He also wants us to seek personal revival. This is something we ought to be seeking after all the time, that we would be uh, excited, that we would be filled with the Spirit of God, filled with His love, and doing His will. Because again, remember, ultimately, that's the only thing that matters in this life. The only thing that matters is what we do for the Lord. Everything else is just wood, hay, and stubble. It's all going to be burned up on the day of judgment. It's worthless. The only thing that is precious to the Lord is what we do for Him. So if we're going to live wisely, we should seek to do all that we do for Him. And if we're going to do that, we need to be revived. So let's read about that in Psalm 119, verses 25 through 32. The psalmist writes, My soul cleaves to the dust. Revive me according to your word. I have told of my ways, and you have answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so I will meditate on your wonders. My soul weeps because of grief. Strengthen me according to your word. Remove the false way from me and graciously grant me your law. I have chosen the faithful way. I have placed your ordinances before me. I cling to your testimonies. O oh Lord, do not put me to shame. I shall run the way of your commandments, for you will enlarge my heart. I want you to see that at the very end, uh, just the optimism, the encouragement. He knows he's seeking what it is that the Lord wants to give him, what the Lord wants to do in him, so he knows that God will answer. He will have the strength not only to walk in the commandments, but to run in that direction because the Lord will enlarge his heart. In other words, he will revive him. Well, again, as I mentioned, uh, Psalm 119 shows us all the many ways that God's law is really a blessing to us. So while a majority of, of Christendom, sadly, is looking at the law in a negative light as something that we really should have nothing to do with, lest we be charged with legalism and uh, be cast away from the Lord as those trying to save themselves by their works, uh, we see it in another light. We see it as really the Lord gives it to us, as the standard by which the Lord would have us to live, to show our thankfulness for His mercies, not to save ourselves. Uh, the psalmist actually is extolling the many virtues of the law of God, and Psalm 119 is a way to get us to focus more on it, that we might learn more about it, and that we might, most importantly, live more according to it. Well, again, uh, we have seen thus far that God's law shows us the way of blessing. He started off the, the psalm uh, with, you might say, one of those personal incentives. How blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. The law of God does bring a blessing. He told us in the second section it does that mainly by showing us how to purify our hearts so that we might live a life that is more pleasing to the Lord, which ultimately, as I mentioned before, will bring us a greater reward because more of the things we'll be doing will be treasures we're storing up in heaven versus just worthless things that are going to be blown away on the day of judgment. Uh, but the psalmist also reminded us that as we live according to the will of God, when you obey it and others see you obeying it, that it is going to bring persecution. That's what he said in, well, I think it was the, um, the third section, right? But we need to remember that that too is a blessing. It's actually one of the blessings that the law of God brings is that we would be persecuted. 
And we don't often think about persecution as a blessing. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So often we think of persecution as something that's rather negative, but our Lord tells us it's actually a blessing to be persecuted because when we are, God rewards us for it. I think I don't need to remind you that Paul gloried in the fact that he bore in his own bodies the brand marks of Jesus Christ, which means the scars that he got for preaching the gospel and having to face the hatred, the persecution, the insults, the ire of his audience. Now, this evening we're going to consider that what the psalmist is, is actually encouraging us to do here as we seek to know God's will, to know His law with this kind of resolve um, and how to apply it to our lives is really going to bring another consequence that on the surface may appear to be negative, may appear to be bad, like persecution, but is actually a very good thing that the Lord wants to do in our lives, and that is conviction. It will bring conviction that leads to renewal, to revival, if we are in fact the Lord's. And of course, we know the law of God can also bring a conviction that leads to conversion if we aren't the Lord's. And I think the point is this, that the more you look into the law of God, the more you understand it, the more you see the holiness of God in His law, the more you're going to see something that's true about you, and that is your sin. And you're also going to see how much more you are in need of personal revival. The law shows us our shortcomings. It shows us how much we need the Lord. It drives us to Him that we might be revived, that our hearts might be enlarged so that we can walk uh, more carefully in the law of God and uh, honor the Lord and receive His blessings. So what I'd like to do this evening is look through this section like we did last week with a series of questions and answers. If you have the sheets I prepared, you have the questions. If you don't have those sheets, don't worry. I'm going to give you the questions anyway. But first of all, we might ask this question. What effect should the law of God have on you as you seek to understand it in the way the psalmist tells us we should? Well, first of all, we see it should humble you and drive you to the Lord in prayer. He begins in verse 25, my soul cleaves to the dust, revive me according to your word. Now, why was his soul cleaving to the dust? Well, it was because he was convicted of his sins as he read the law of God. And what does it mean that his soul cleaves to the dust? Well, it means that by reading the law of God and seeing what it, re what it really requires and what his life was like, it humbled him to the ground. That's one way or one thing it might mean. Another thing is that it showed him that according to God's standard, what it is he really deserved, and that is death. The wages of sin is death. My soul cleaves to the dust. In other words, I deserve to be in the ground. I think we see here what Paul meant in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, when he said, for the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. What he means by that is that the law of God, simply written on stone or even written on the page, doesn't have the ability to give life. The law can only condemn us. The law can only kill us. Remind you, for those of you who have read Pilgrim's Progress or were a part of the study on Wednesday nights, uh, how in the case of faithful, uh, Moses, who represented the law, uh, came up behind faithful he, as he was going up the hill difficulty as swift as the wind and knocked him to the ground. And when faithful came to and he asked Moses for mercy, mercy, uh, Moses said, I don't know how to show mercy. And he decked him again and would have finished him if the Lord hadn't come by and told Moses to leave him alone. 
You see, Moses there, is, that's not the way Moses really was. He was actually a very humble and gentle man. But um, he was representing the law in, in this uh, allegory. And the law can only strike you. The law can only condemn you. That's what the law would do to you and to me if it were not for the Lord's mercy, if the Lord didn't come by and say to Moses or to the law to forbear uh, because he has paid the price for our sins. But now we do need to remember it's not because there's a problem with the law. It's because of our sin. That's why it can strike us. That's why it can kill us. The law actually is holy and righteous and good. There is nothing wrong with the law. The law simply requires perfection. It requires perfect love. And we can't be perfect. We can't love perfectly. And so it condemns us for our failure to do what it calls us to do. Now, even, even as Christians, knowing that the Lord has forgiven us in Christ, we know that the law can't kill us because now in Christ we're safe, in Christ we're alive, we do need to realize that the law still serves as a constant reminder of what it is we really do deserve, but for the grace of God, we deserve death. But even that is meant to be a blessing to us from the Lord. It's actually meant to help us when we understand what our sins really deserve. And again, I think the psalmist, I know the psalmist, writes what he writes from the perspective of a redeemed man. Even though you're redeemed, even though you're trusting in the Messiah who is to come and already just in God's eyes, the law of God will still humble you to the dust. Now, the Westminster Assembly when they were putting together the, the Westminster Confession, which I think is a very, very helpful document, uh, wrote this in chapter 19, section 6, regarding the law of God as to how it can benefit those of us who are believers. This is what they write. Although true believers are not under the law as a covenant of works to be justified uh, by it or condemned, yet it is of great use to them as well as to others, in that as a rule of life, informing them of the will of God and their duty, it directs and binds them to walk accordingly, uh, revealing also the sinful pollutions of their nature, hearts, and lives, so as examining themselves by it, they may come to further conviction of, humiliation for, and hatred against sin, together with a clearer sight of the need they have of Christ and the perfection of His obedience. It is likewise of use to the regenerate to restrain their corruptions in that it forbids sin and the threatenings of it serve to show what even their sins deserve and what afflictions in this life they may expect for them although freed from the curse threatened in the law. The promises of it in like manner show them God's approval of obedience and what blessings they may expect upon the performance of it, although not as due to them by the law of a, as a covenant of works, so as a man's doing good and refraining from evil because the law encourages to the one and deters from the other is no evidence of his being under the law and not under grace. Anyway, it tells us again of the many benefits that the law of God actually has for us. The one that we're looking at, the one that we're interested in, is that it has the ability uh, to bring us to conviction, humiliation, hatred against sin, show us how much more we need Christ, and it reminds us even what our sins deserve. You realize that as Christians, when we sin, those sins still deserve death. But the Lord doesn't give us death because Christ has taken that curse on Himself. We have been removed from that curse. And yet, our sins still deserve it. The psalmist says, my soul cleaves to the dust. He goes on to say later, my soul weeps because of grief. And the reason is because he has failed to keep the law of God as he should. So the more clearly you see what God wants in His law, 
the more clearly you're going to see your sin. And the better you will understand what it is you really deserve, but by the grace of God, and that is a very humbling thing, but that is a good thing. Sometimes um, we, we react to these kinds of things in a negative way, in, a, in the opposite way. We, we think that this is a bad thing. If, if studying God's law makes me feel like this, makes me feel humiliated, makes me feel convicted, makes me feel like a sinner, makes me feel like I deserve to die, then I'll just stop studying it so I'll feel better about myself. And that's how a lot of Christians respond to this, or at least professing Christians. But we should see that that's not the right response. We should be convicted so that we'll respond in the way that the psalmist responded. He said, Lord, my soul cleaves to the dust, so revive me according to your word. In other words, Lord, forgive me and renew in my heart the desire to follow you with an even greater zeal. That's why the Lord wants us to study and meditate on His law in the first place so that we might know our sins, so that we might be humbled, and that it might drive us to the Lord in prayer so that we might gain the power to keep it. That's what revival is all about. Again, the enlarging of our hearts, which means a heart that loves God and His law more so that we will walk in it more. So again, the first point is the effect of reading the law of God should be that it humbles us and drives us to the Lord. Well, secondly, what else should you do when the Lord reveals this sin to you besides, of course, going to the Lord for the power to keep it? Well, the psalmist also talks about what we should do whenever the Lord reveals sin to us. And certainly we need to go to the Lord and we need to ask Him for revival, we need to ask Him for strength, but He also reminds us that we need to confess that sin to Him, confess that we are guilty. Uh, the pride of man will not allow him to confess that he has faults. As a matter of fact, that's probably one of our greatest weaknesses, isn't it? Even as redeemed believers is fighting against our pride. We, we hate to think that we're weak in any way. We, think, we hate to think that we've failed. And yet... We must humble ourselves before the Lord and confess our sins if we are, in fact, forgiven by the Lord. And I believe that's what we have when the psalmist says in verse 26, I have told of my ways, and you have answered me. I believe it's talking about the psalmist confessing his sinful ways to the Lord and the Lord answering him in mercy. Now, it is true from Scripture that when you trust in the Lord, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, all of your sins are forgiven, all of them, past, present, and future. But it's also true according to Scripture that if you are forgiven, you will continually confess your sins as you become aware of them. And as you do that, the Lord will continually cleanse you of them. 1 John verse, uh, chapter 1, he writes this, if we confess our sins, and the idea here behind the original language is the idea of a continual confessing. If we are continually confessing our sins, He is faithful and just, continually to forgive us of our sins and continually to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, the mark of being a true believer, according to John, is that when we become aware of sin, we humble ourselves and confess it to the Lord and ask for His forgiveness. And as we are doing this, He is continually cleansing us. Now, that raises a question. Does that mean if I become aware of sin and before I can confess it, I die, or maybe I haven't become aware of it and I never confess it and I die, does that mean that I'm not going to go to heaven? because I'm not forgiven or cleansed? Well, thankfully, the answer to that is, uh, no, you will go to heaven because that sin is forgiven whether you confess it or not. Don't use that as an excuse not to confess it because the Lord tells us we need to confess it. But we need to remember that forgiveness, as we saw this morning in the book of Hebrews, is an all-or-nothing thing. It's a one-time event if it's all for the believer. 
that forgives all of our sins, past, present, and future. The author to the Hebrews said in chapter 10, verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. In other words, if you've trusted Christ, your sins are all forgiven on the basis of that one sacrifice. Your confession of sin is not what pardons you. Jesus' death on the cross is what pardons you. Your confession is simply the evidence that God has forgiven you. It's also His command, so don't forget to confess your sins. But again, knowing that He has blotted out all of your sins through the Lord Jesus Christ, your response should be one of prayer from the heart out of thankfulness that the Lord would even show you more of His Word. It's kind of like a virtuous circle, isn't it? You read the law of God, you see your sin, you confess your sin, you know the Lord has forgiven you, and so out of thankfulness, you read more and seek more, and you pray more that God would show you what He wants you to do. The psalmist prayed that God would teach him His statutes more clearly, that He would help him to understand them and meditate on them. Verses 26 and 27, teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts so that I will meditate on your wonders. And again, the purpose is that he might be even more convicted and more humbled before the Lord, that he might confess his sins more, more wholeheartedly and walk in his ways more closely. See, the point is this, that being convicted, being humbled, confessing your sins or the fact that you need to do that, shouldn't drive you away from the Lord, but it should drive you to the Lord, that He might strengthen you more. You see, that's what it means to be revived, and that's how the Word of God, how the law of God in particular can bring you to personal revival, because as you study it and see how you fall short and how much you need of Christ, it drives you to Him, that you might gain greater strength to live according to His Word. So again, the, the law of God humbles us and it causes us to seek for revival. The law of God is um, something that points out our sins that we should be willing to confess to the Lord and again pray that God would teach us more. But thirdly, the psalmist reminds us that it's not enough simply to be humbled and even to be humbled to the point of confession that there is something more that needs to be there, something else the Lord wants from you, something else He intends the law of God actually to produce in you, and that is, of course, repentance and obedience. In verse 28, He says, my soul weeps because of grief, which means I'm not keeping your law, and I want to keep it. So He says, strengthen me according to your word. The fact that He's not able to keep it the way He wants to is what's causing him distress. And so he prays that the Lord would strengthen him to keep it. You know, if, if you know that you're supposed to do something, but you don't do it, uh, there's really no benefit to that. There's really only a downside to it because the more you know, uh, the more culpable, the more blamable you are for not doing what you should do. Well, that's exactly what the psalmist realized. That's why he was humbled. That's why he was grieved in the first place is because he knew what God required, but he wasn't keeping the commandments the way that he should keep them. And he was also humbled because that's what he wanted to do, but he couldn't do it. You know how it is when you want something, you know, you want it badly, and you really just can't seem to get it, and how disappointing that is, how much it grieves you. The same thing is true when you hunger and thirst after righteousness, which is what Jesus said, you're blessed if you are. It's also a mark that the Spirit of God is at work within you. When you hunger and thirst to be more like Jesus Christ and you just can't seem to do it, you just can't seem to achieve it, uh, the result is grief. And so the response should be prayer. Again, prayer for strength to be able to turn around, that the Lord would give you the grace to overcome the, the struggle, the disobedience, uh, 
and help you to obey. Again, he says in verse 29, remove the false way from me and graciously grant me your law. Help me to see it clearly. Help me to walk in that way. Now, again, he did this because that is what he really wanted to do. This was his great desire. He says in verse 30, I have chosen the faithful way. I have placed your ordinances before me. Now, think about just that one statement. I have chosen the faithful way. That's what I want. I have placed your ordinances before me. I'm not trying to get them out of, out of my, my sight. I'm not trying to work my way around them. This is what the Lord really wants, isn't it? This is the kind of heart He wants you to have when you come to His Word. And that is not to see how I can find my way around it, how I can get what I want and still convince myself that I'm obeying the Lord. Sometimes we come to the Word of God and we tell God what we want Him to say rather than simply letting Him speak for Himself. Well, the Lord wants us to choose the faithful path. He wants us to listen to Him, to, well, have His ordinances before us at all times. In other words, He wants us to come and listen. He wants us to come with a submissive heart, to listen, to learn, and to do what it is the Lord calls you to do. He wants you to have the heart of a Samuel who said to the Lord when the Lord called him originally, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You know, you're the Lord, I'm the servant, speak and I will listen and I will do. He wants you to have that kind of heart that's going to hold fast to His ways. I think we saw that something about that this morning, didn't we? The Lord had opened the door to heaven through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So draw near, He says, but then hold fast to Jesus Christ. That's what He wants you to do. He wants you to hold to Jesus Christ and to His ways no matter what it may cost you, no matter what you have to give up. No matter what others might think about you and how they might respond to you, even if the whole world turns against you, He wants you to have the heart of a martyr. You know, that's what Jesus actually means when He says, pick up your cross. If you're going to come after Me, pick up your cross and follow Me. You have to have the heart of a martyr. You have to be willing to pay the ultimate price before you even follow Him. You have to actually die to yourself to follow Him. Uh, you need to have that kind of heart that the early Christians had who, um, when they were told, you know, we want, uh, Caesar said, you know, you need to offer a pinch of incense to me, and you need to say that Caesar is Lord, and if you do that, you'll live. Well, the Christians would rather die than do that. So what they did was they allowed themselves to be captured and to be thrown to the lions because they refused to do a simple little thing like offer a pinch of incense to Caesar and say Caesar is Lord. They wouldn't do that because they knew that Jesus was Lord and He alone was the one that they were going to worship. So even if by doing the right thing, by, by choosing the faithful path, by having God's commandments continually before you, you have to pay the ultimate price, that's what you should be willing to pay. That's what it means to have a heart after God's own heart, to have a heart that is revived. Or again, like that of Athanasius. Athanasius was one of the, um, well, the early... Uh, defenders of the faith, the one who was defending the doctrine of the Trinity, that Jesus is not just of a like substance with the Father, He's not a creation of God, He's not God's greatest creation, He is God Himself, the second person of the Godhead, of the same substance of the Father. And for that, Athanasius was actually deposed and exported, or what do you say, he was, he was thrown out of the country five times in his lifetime. And on his tombstone, I think you recall that it was written, Athanasius against the world, because it looked like Athanasius was standing alone for orthodoxy. But he was willing to do that. Uh, he was willing to stand up even against the whole church for what was true and what was right. That's the kind of heart that the psalmist had. And that's the kind of heart that we need to have. Uh, that we would desire God and His ways no matter what we would have to pay. And of course, the psalmist did this in the hope that though he might be put to shame in this world, though the people of this world might hate him and think him to be worthless, that in the end, he ultimately would not be put to shame, 
because he knew that this is what God wanted. The Lord would honor him for this. He says in verse 31, I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Do not put me to shame. Now, that's what it means to be revived. It means to be willing to do whatever the Lord calls you to do, no matter what the cost, realizing that in the end, you ultimately will not be put to shame. Though people in the world might treat you poorly, though they might hate you, though you might have to give up many things, you realize in the end, you will be honored. And so again, the psalmist, you know, has the desire being humbled by the Word of God to be revived and to confess his sins and to turn from his sins and obey the Lord. And so that's what he was praying for. That's what he was asking for, that God would give him the strength to have that kind of resolve. That's what he desired, but he wanted an even stronger desire. I mean, when we read what he says here, we might suspect this was a man who already had a heart that was revived. And yet, as he looks at his own life, he continually prays, revive me according to your will. So finally, we want to ask the question, what can you expect from the Lord when you pray for this, when you pray for these kinds of things? Well, you can expect that the Lord will hear you and that He will give you what you have asked for because this is what He wants you to ask for. This this is what he loves to do. This is the kind of request that he loves to answer. And the psalmist knew it. Verse 32, I shall run the way of your commandments, for you will enlarge my heart. See, the psalmist believed he knew that the Lord would give him the strength to do this uh, if he only asked that he would help him not only to walk in his ways, but notice the word run. I shall run the way of your commandments. That God would revive his heart, that he would uh, enlarge his heart, that he would give him greater love and greater zeal, a greater desire to honor him. And let me just say that the Lord will do the same thing for you and he'll do the same thing for me if you seek him for the same thing. If you're willing to read the law of God and let it convict you, let it humble you, uh, and if you're willing to confess your sins to the Lord, if you're willing to pray and ask the Lord for a better understanding of His ways so that you can repent and obey better, if this is what your heart desires more than anything else, to walk in His ways, or to put it in other terms, if you really do want to follow His Son, Jesus Christ, and be made more like Him, then God will grant that to you because that's exactly what He wants you to have. He even commands you to have it. Be filled with the Spirit, not with yourself, not with your flesh, not with your lusts or desires after other things. God doesn't want you to be filled with those things. He wants you to be filled with His Spirit. So if you have this desire, this is a prayer that He will answer. He will enlarge your heart. He will give you a greater love, a greater zeal for His glory, not just to walk in His ways, but to run in His ways. Now again, I hope that sounds like something you want because that's what we should want from the Word of God and that's what Jesus wanted and that's what He pursued, although His heart was already perfect. He was running in the ways of the Lord because His heart was enlarged, really as large as it could get in love for the Lord because he was anointed with the Spirit without measure. There was no limit to, to the, the influence of the Spirit in his own heart. Now, if you want that, what do you have to do to get it? Well, you have to do what the psalmist did. You need to read the law of God. You need to pray that the Lord would help you to see what it is you need to see. James tells us that the law of God is like a mirror that's able to show us what we really look like. You know, let's just say you live in a world without mirrors and you had no idea what you look like because there wouldn't be any way unless you could see your reflection. Well, we really don't know what we look like, you see, as far as God's holiness until we look at the law of God. It's a mirror that shows us all of our warts and all of our blemishes. So you need to look into the law of God and let it search and examine your heart. Look into that mirror. See what you really look like 
And then seek the Lord for His grace to turn from your sins and to run in His ways. That's what personal revival is all about. And that's what the Lord wants each of us to do. So let's, uh, let's pray that God would help us to do that, especially as we look toward the table, that He would give us the desire to be more like His Son, to walk in His ways and to give glory to Him. Let, let's bow in a moment of prayer and, and let's pray that God would help us resolve to do that.